Thank you very much, uh, James. Glad to be here. Wish I uh, could be in uh, South Africa in, in, in person. Quick intro, um, I'm Andy Fleury, uh, founder and CEO at AlgoTrader. I worked uh, at a Swiss uh, hedge fund uh, for many years where we traded uh, automated uh, trading strategies um, and started um, AlgoTrader in 2014. Um, originally, we supported traditional assets, so equities, futures, derivatives, and since uh, 2017, we also support cryptos. And as you can imagine, uh, in the meantime, a big part of our business is actually in, uh, in, in, in cryptos. The topic, I'll give you a um, bit more uh, insights about what we do at, um, at AlgoTrader. Um, we are a Swiss-based uh, company. Um, we uh, provide a system uh, for quantitative uh, trading strategies and algorithmic execution. So we basically uh, provide the uh, full life cycle from um, you know strategy design to to back testing, optimization, simulation, deployment, and so forth. Um, we have also an extensive API, and on the crypto side, we connect to the 25 uh, largest and regulated uh, venues out there. Um, we're a team of uh, roughly 30 people. Um, Zurich is our headquarter, and then we have an office in New York and an office in, in Singapore. And we're a, a, a typical uh, fintech uh, startup. Uh, we're backed by investors like Credit Suisse, uh, Blockchain Valley Ventures, New Capital, and uh, and. So, as I mentioned, uh, we support uh, both traditional asset classes, and that's still uh, part of our business, but also uh, crypto and digital assets uh, connect to many exchanges, uh, brokers, market makers, OTC desks, uh, liquidity aggregators, and so forth. Um, we support both uh, automated trading by the API, but you can also use our, our UI uh, to trade uh, manually. Also have lots of support um, to, to, uh, to trade large orders, things like smart order routing, execution algos, RFQ, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more um, about that. Um, and uh, what you see here, um, this is actually um, the user interface of our platform. Um, so it provides everything a typical, um, an institutional trader needs from, from, from charting, uh, you know, order uh, management, market data, uh, open positions, transactions, and, and, and so forth. Um, so that's all uh, about us. Now let me uh, dive into the main topic. Um, I'll start on a, on a general uh, basis, kind of, uh, you know, what to look out for, uh, what's, what's uh, special uh, for, for crypto hedge funds, what sort of uh, differentiates them from uh, traditional hedge funds. And then in the second part, if we have enough time, um, I'll try to give a, a bit of uh, insights, a bit of best practices and advice for anybody that actually wants to start a crypto fund. So, um, as you might know, accessing crypto liquidity um, is, is actually not that simple because of its fragmented nature. There are over 350 uh, exchanges today, so you can kind of view the, um, the crypto liquidity um, uh, landscape as a network of liquidity uh, sources and consumers. Um, unfortunately, many of these players don't disclose their, their true sources of liquidity. So uh, to achieve best prices, you'd actually have to work with many of these, uh, these players and tap into this network at multiple uh, places and compare prices before you send an order. Um, you know, for, for hedge funds uh, and, and banks also, we recommend to work with at least three to five players. Um, but that's not um, uh, that easy and trivial as well. Um, to do this yourself, you'd have to build, operate, and maintain connectivity to many of these venues and, and implement and maintain an execution management system to ensure you're getting uh, best prices. As there are no common standards in the crypto space, uh, building and maintaining these connections is, is very resource intensive and, and error prone. So this is actually where AlgoTrader uh, comes into play. We provide you with a single API connection uh, to the most liquid and regulated uh, venues out there. 
So when we talk about um, when we talk about uh, venues, um, there are basically uh, three types of venues, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those those venue types. Um, let's start with exchanges. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, the big difference to the other ones is that you have to pre-fund uh, the exchange accounts, which is often a problem for larger players. Some exchanges offer credit lines uh, to select the customers, but for that you need to uh, you know, have, have a long-standing um, track record with the exchange. Fees have dropped quite, quite a bit uh, over the years. They're roughly in the range of zero to, to uh, 25, uh, 25 basis points. Um, a big thing to watch out for is uh, fiat settlements, uh, especially if you do international uh, transfers via the SWIFT network. That's often very slow. So how does this compare to uh, brokers? Uh, brokers um, provide trading uh, on based on credit lines. So you don't actually need to pre-fund um, the account. Um, quite expensive, um, anywhere from half a percent to two percent, especially the Swiss brokers are quite expensive. Um, they also provide APIs, but they're generally less mature and not as frequently used. So a lot of trading happens over the phone. And then the last group is uh, market makers and, and OTC desks. Um, so they also don't require you to, uh, to pre-fund the account and uh, provide credit limits. Um, and then they support something that's called a post-trade settlement. So at the end of the day, you can kind of um, send them the fiat and you'll get the crypto back and, and vice versa. So this is called the DVP, delivery uh, versus pay. Um, fees are, uh, well, there aren't actually any trading fees with market makers because they include their cost into the spread. And spreads are typically as low as 10 basis points, so at a tenth of a per, uh, percent. Um, little issue is that, that market makers um, are not open for retail traders, and they, they do require a quite substantial minimum monthly transaction volume. Typically, it's at least a million um, some of the bigger ones like Jump and Cumberland actually require uh, 10 million. So um, there is one other uh, general topic I quickly want to touch. Uh, when you're trading large orders, you basically have uh, two choices, and they're called best X and OTC or RFQ trading. So when we talk about best X, we typically talk about something called execution algos that split up large orders into smaller child orders. Um, these al algos are, are used in combination with something called a smart order router um, that automatically selects the best venue uh, for each order based on the current price. Um, with our solution, Albatrade, we actually provide quite a few out-of-the-box execution algos, and we also have an off-the-shelf smart order router. Um, RFQ, on the other hand, means um, you're asking uh, venues to provide a binding quote to buy or sell a certain quantity of an asset. Um, also on that side, um, our system can fully automate this process and we even um, allow you to automatically, automatically send out RFQs to multiple venues and then automatically select the best quote uh, received. So the main difference is uh, with RFQ, you already know how much you're going to pay before you're committing to the trade. Um, however, you know this, this certainty um, that you're getting with RFQ, that's not free. The market maker will price their risk uh, into the spread. Uh, so, with with best X, on the other hand, uh, you know you might be facing price moves while you are, while you execute the order. This might play in your favor, uh, or it might play against you. Um, our recommendation is use RFQ if you're in a hurry. Um, otherwise, use best X. Um, as they're typically cheaper in the long run. Um, custody is, is obviously also something to watch out for. I'm not going to go uh, into the details uh, because we don't provide that uh, custody and, and there is many people that, that uh, you know, uh, can explain this topic much better than we can. Um, 
basically there's just uh, three options on exchange so you're basically leaving your assets on the exchange obviously that's a bit risky um then self-custody um you know i i I, I don't actually see any uh, institutional traders or hedge funds anymore these days that use self custody. Uh, it's it, you know the security risk and operational overhead is just too big. And then there is uh, luckily these days many many of those institutional custodians or, or custody providers that give you everything from hot, warm, cold with with APIs, transfer networks, and so forth. Um, so I definitely go for the last option and only try to transfer as little as, as, as necessary um, to the exchanges. Um, good. Then, um, you know, let's get back to the actual uh, hedge fund uh, business. What, what is algorithmic trading? You know, what does that term mean? Unfortunately, it's a little bit ambiguous. Uh, it has kind of two meanings. Uh, one is signal generation. That means, you know, you have some uh, mathematical model um, that generates a trading signal, buy or sell trading signal for you based on market data or alternative data. Um, there is many, many types of, of strategies, you know, anywhere from technical analysis, that's the most popular one, you know, using moving averages, RSI. Uh, but there's also uh, arbitrage, market making itself counts as, as a trading strategy, uh, high frequency trading, news trading, and there's many more. So that's the signal generation, that's the decision logic. On the other hand, uh, the second part is the automated order execution. So to actually execute a signal uh, using orders into the market uh, with variety of order types, execution algos, and so forth. Um, so those are the two uh, the two parts, and and um, you know we recommend kind of looking at both of those separately. So um, in the last few slides, um, I'm going to uh, give a bit of uh, suggestions uh, out to someone who wants to start a hedge fund um, or a crypto fund, um, and give a, a few best practices. So so what do you need? Obviously, you need to select a, a broker or an exchange. Uh, and, and there the fees will, will play an important role. You'll have to look at the regular status of, of the venue. Um, then, you know, we, we obviously highly recommend using a, a platform like ours. You know, don't try to build a platform yourself. Um, you know, also avoid having, building something, you know, building a back test and then using a completely different system for, for live, live trading. Speed and latency um, will have an influence on, on what you're doing, you know, and, and that also has an influence on where you run your trading uh, system. You know, is it your own server? Is it is it a cloud server? Or is it even a co-located server? You know, is your system going to run in the same data center as the exchange? Um, who's going to do the coding for you? You know, if it's an automated strategy, um, you obviously need someone with, with development skills. Um, usually for that, uh, you know, a seasoned uh, software development background is, is more suited than a, than a quantitative uh, PhD. Um, then, then live trading, you know, who's going to monitor your system during the trading uh, market hours? We, rec you know, if you're actually trading live, we, even if everything is automated, we recommend that somebody is there to, uh, to monitor um, the system. Uh, once you have uh, your initial system up and running, um, you know, you obviously want to get as best of performance as possible. Um, here are some recommendations how to improve performance. Uh, avoid, um, you know, pitfalls like uh, the look-ahead bias, so do uh, extensive backtesting. Um, something we always see is that people forget to uh, to, to um, factor in fees and, and, and slippage and partial executions uh, during their, their, their backtesting, and then they're surprised that their live trading performance um, is going to be different. Uh, obviously, if you're trading derivatives like futures and options, there are certain things to watch out for, like uh, rolling, uh, for example. Um, use different data sets. You know, if you're backtesting uh, over five years, um, don't just optimize over those five years. You know, maybe take the first three years to build your backtest and then use the last two years to, to verify uh, your, your results. 
Um, be careful uh, when optimizing your strategies. Often people tend to over-optimize and tweak the parameters so that you get a really, really good performance. Um, this is bad because in live trading, the situation is often much different. Uh, so you want to avoid that. Um, obviously, you know, testing, and this includes back testing, but then also sandbox testing. Um, some exchanges do offer that. Then use, um, you know, small accounts over multiple weeks uh, before, you know, you use your, your, your big money um, accounts. Um, I'm going to um, jump straight to my last slide um, and talk a little bit more about uh, pitfalls and challenges specifically uh, related to crypto trading. Um, venue stability, this is becoming uh, much better than it used to be a few years ago, um, but still don't rely on just one venue, uh, one exchange. Please expect outages. Uh, some might be unavailable uh, or hard to trade during during volatility. Um, execution limitations, so speed and latency is always a problem. Um, rest rate limit, so you can only send you know a certain number of events um, to the to the uh, event uh, to the venue. Um, lack of standardization. I mentioned that one. Beginning, there is no common standards uh, such as fix in the crypto world. Uh, withdrawal deposit often there are limits. Um, settlement process um, can be difficult. Um, you know, supported order types. Uh, not all venues support all order types. Margin trading limits, again, uh, if you're trading derivatives, there is no standards. Um, these limits also aren't um, always available via API. So even though you might be trading on an automated basis, you might not actually have access to your uh, trading limits. And then obviously uh, liquidity manual, uh, liquidity man management. So how do you move um, your assets to and from the exchange? You know, do you do that manual? You know, that that's obviously error prone. You know, you might have typos in your in your uh, blockchain addresses. Um, our recommendation is to use settlement networks. Um, luckily, there there are quite a few out there. Uh, you know, Fireblocks has one, Copper, um, Bitgo. So they're just much more convenient uh, to transfer your asset. And some of them, uh, and that's really interesting, and I think is going to be a game changer, also support instant transfers. So you can actually transfer your assets to the venue right before uh, you place a trade. Good. Um, that was it from, from my side. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed um, this presentation here and uh, I hope you found it helpful. Um, if you're setting up a hedge fund or a crypto fund or you already have one, need assistance um, you know, from, from, from our side, uh, we're very happy to help uh, building your system, optimize it, uh, run it. Uh, we've, we've done this for many, many years. Fantastic. Andy, thank you so much. What a great talk and overview of uh, the trading landscape, especially in the crypto asset landscape. So.